the 19th letter. This treatise describes more than 300 miracles, and as it describes the messengership of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, itself a miracle, so is itself a wonder in three or four respects, proceeding from the miracle of his messengership. The first, although it is more than a hundred pages in length and is based on traditions and narrations, it was written in an unusual fashion, in the mountains and countryside, completely from memory, and without referring to any book. It was completed, moreover, in a few days, by working two to three hours every day, for a total of twelve hours. The second, despite its length, this work did not cause tedium to its writer, nor does it lack pleasantness for its reader. In fact, it aroused such ardor and enthusiasm in even my apathetic scribes, that in these hard and distressing times, as many as seventy copies were handwritten in this neighborhood within a single year. Those aware of this property of the treatise concluded that it must be a wonder proceeding from the miracle of his messengership, alayhi salatu was salam. The third, in the copies handwritten by nine different scribes who did not communicate with one another, including one very inexperienced and unaware of coincidence, it was also before we were aware of the phenomenon. The words referring to the noble messenger coincided to such a degree throughout the whole of the treatise and in the fifth part of the words referring to the Qur'an, that anyone who is fair to the slightest degree would not consider this to be the result of chance. In fact, whoever observed it definitely concluded that it was a mystery of the unseen and a marvel proceeding from the miracle of Muhammad, alayhi salatu was salam. The principles explained at the beginning of this treatise have extreme importance. As for the prophetic hadiths related, they are accepted as authentic, by the authorities on hadith and they report the most established phenomena concerning the messengership of Muhammad. Now, to enumerate the merits of this treatise, another treatise of the same length would be needed. We therefore invite those who wish to read it, if only once. Zaid Nursi. A reminder, in this work I have related many hadiths, despite having no books to refer to. Should there be any errors in the wording of the hadiths, I request that they either be corrected or be considered as paraphrases of hadith. For according to the prevailing opinion, to relate the meanings of hadiths is permissible, in which case the narrator puts the meaning of the hadith into his own words. This being the case, hadiths with possible errors of wording should be regarded as paraphrases. Note, the present translation of the 19th letter is based on a translation prepared by members of the Risali Nord Institute of America in 1976. The Miracles of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam In his name be he glorified, and there is nothing but it glorifies him with praise. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to make it supreme over all religion. And sufficient is Allah as a witness. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to the end of the verse. Since the 19th and 31st words concerning the messengership of Muhammad والسلام, prove it with decisive evidence, we assign the verification of that side of the subject to those words. As a supplement to them, we will merely show here in 19 signs some of the flashes of that great truth. First sign. The possessor and master of the universe surely does everything with knowledge, disposes every affair with wisdom, directs everything all-seeingly, treats everything all-knowingly, and arranges everything, willing the instances of wisdom, purposes, benefits that are apparent in them. Since then, the one who creates knows, surely the one who knows, will speak. Since he will speak, surely he will speak to those who possess consciousness and thought, and those who will understand his speech. Since he will speak to those who possess thought, surely he will speak to mankind, whose nature and awareness are the most comprehensive of all conscious beings. Since he will speak to mankind, surely he will speak to the most perfect of mankind, and those most worthy of address. Since he will speak to those who are most perfect, most worthy of address, highest in morality, 
and who will guide humanity, he will certainly speak to Muhammad, who as friend and foe alike testify, is of the highest disposition and morality, who is obeyed by one-fifth of humanity, to whose spiritual rule half of the globe has submitted, with the radiance of whose light the future of mankind has been illumined for thirteen centuries, to whom the believers, the luminous segment of humanity, renew five times daily the oath of allegiance, for whose happiness they pray, for whom they call down Allah's blessings, and bear admiration and love in their hearts. Certainly, he will speak to Muhammad, alayhi salatu wassalam, and indeed he has done. He will make him the prophet, and indeed he has done. He will make him the guide for the rest of humanity, and indeed he has done. Second sign. Allah's most noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, declared his prophethood and presented to humanity such a decree as the Qur'an of mighty stature and such manifest miracles as number, according to the scholars, 1,000. The occurrence of those miracles in their entirety is as certain as the fact that he declared himself prophet. In fact, as is shown by the words of the most obstinate unbelievers quoted in various places of the wise Qur'an, even they could not deny the occurrence of his miracles, but only called them Allah forbid sorcery in order to satisfy themselves or to deceive their followers. The miracles of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have the certainty of confirmation by consensus to the hundredth degree. The miracle is the confirmation by the creator of the cosmos of his declaration of prophethood. It has the effect of the words, you have spoken truly. Suppose that you said in the assembly of a ruler, while being observed by him, the ruler has appointed me to such and such a position. At a time when you were asked for a proof of your claim, the word yes uttered by the ruler would sufficiently support you. Or, if the ruler changed his usual practice and attitude at your request, this would confirm your claim even more soundly and more definitely than would the word yes. In the same way, the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, claimed, I am the envoy of the creator of the universe. My proof is that he will change his unbroken order at my request and my prayer. Now look at my fingers. He causes them to run like a fountain with five spigots. Look at the moon. By a gesture of my finger, he splits it in two. Look at that tree. To affirm me and to bear witness to me, it moves and comes near to me. Look at this food. Although it is barely enough for two or three men, it satisfies two or three hundred. He demonstrated to hundreds of similar miracles. However, the evidences of the veracity of this being and the proofs of his prophethood are not restricted to his miracles. All his deeds and acts, his words and behavior, his moral conduct and manners, his character and appearance prove to the attentive his truthfulness and seriousness. Indeed, Many people such as Abdullah bin Salam, the famous scholar of the children of Israel, came to believe merely by seeing him and said, No lie can hide in his face, nor fraud can be found in it. Although many scholars who have researched the matter have concluded that the proofs of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his miracles number about 1,000, there are thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of proofs of his prophethood and hundreds of thousands of men with varying opinions have affirmed his prophethood in an equal number of ways. The wise Qur'an alone demonstrates a thousand of the proofs of his prophethood, in addition to its own forty aspects of miraculousness. Since prophethood is a phenomenon of humanity, and hundreds of thousands of individuals who claimed prophethood and performed miracles have lived and passed away, of a certainty, the prophethood of Muhammad is superior to all the others. For whatever evidences, qualities, and attributes made prophets, such as Isa and Musa, alayhim salam, be known as prophets, and were the means of their messengership, they were all possessed in a more perfect and comprehensive fashion 
by Muhammad wassalam. And since the causes and means of prophetic authority were more perfectly present in the person of Muhammad, this authority was to be found in him with more certainty than in all the others. Third sign. The miracles of the most noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, were extremely varied. Since his messengership was universal, he was distinguished by miracles that related to almost all species of creation. Just as the supreme lieutenant of a renowned ruler, arriving with many gifts in a city where various peoples live, will be welcomed by a representative of each people, who acclaims him and bids him welcome in his own language, so too, when the supreme lieutenant of the monarch of pre-eternity and post-eternity honored the universe by coming as an envoy to the inhabitants of the earth and brought with him the light of truth and spiritual gifts sent by the creator of the universe, which were connected to the truths of the whole universe, each species of creation, from water, rocks, trees, animals and human beings, to the moon, the sun, and the stars, each welcomed him and acclaimed his prophethood, each in its own language, and each bearing one of his miracles. Now, it will require a voluminous work to mention all his miracles. As punctilious investigating scholars have written many volumes concerning the proofs of his prophethood, here we will briefly point out only the general categories into which fall the miracles that are definite and accepted as accurate reports. The evidences of the prophethood of Muhammad wassalam, fall into two main categories. The first is called Urdhasat and includes the paranormal events that happened at the time of his birth or before his prophetic mission. The second group pertains to all the remaining evidences of his prophethood and contains two subdivisions. The first are those wonders that were manifested after his departure from this world in order to confirm his prophethood, and the second, those that he exhibited during the era of his prophethood. The latter has also two parts. The first, the evidences of his prophethood that became manifest in his own personality, his inner and outer being, his moral conduct and perfections, and the second, the miracles manifested in the outer world. The last part again has two branches. One, those concerning the Quran and spirituality, and the other, those relating to materiality and the universe. This last branch is again divided into two categories. The first involves the paranormal happenings that occurred during his mission either to break the stubbornness of the unbelievers or to augment the faith of the believers. This category has 20 different sorts, such as the splitting of the moon, the flowing of water from his fingers, the satisfying of large numbers with a little food, and the speaking of trees, rocks, and animals. Each of these sorts has also many instances and thus has in meaning the strength of confirmation by consensus. As for the second category, this includes events lying in the future that occurred as he had predicted upon Allah's instructions. Now, starting from the last category, we will summarize a list of them. Note, unfortunately, I could not write as I had intended. Without choice, I wrote as my heart dictated, and I could not completely conform to the order of this classification. Fourth sign. There is no limit to the reports Allah's most noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, gave concerning the unseen through the instruction of the one all-knowing of the unseen. As we have mentioned, the types of these reports in the 25th word, which is about the miraculousness of the Qur'an, and to a degree explained and proved them, we now refer to that word, the explanation of the information he gave concerning the unseen about past times and prophets, as well as truths concerning divinity, the universe, and the hereafter, and will point out a few of his many correct predictions concerning his companions, his family, and his community. But first, for a complete understanding of the subject, we will state six principles by way of an introduction. First principle, all the states and acts of the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, testify to his veracity and prophethood, but not all of them had to be miraculous. For Allah Almighty sent him in the form of a human being, so that he might be a guide and leader to human beings in their social affairs, 
and in the acts and deeds by means of which they attain happiness in both worlds, and so that he might disclose to human beings the wonders of divine art and his disposive power that underlie all occurrences and are in appearance customary, but in reality are miracles of divine power. If then he had abandoned the human state in his acts and become extraordinary in all aspects, he could not have been a leader or have instructed human beings with his acts, states, and conduct. He was indeed honored with paranormal phenomena in order to prove his prophethood to obstinate unbelievers and from time to time perform miracles as the need arose. But his miracles never occurred in such an obvious fashion as would have compelled everyone to believe, whether willingly or unwillingly. For in accordance with the purpose of the examinations and trials that man is to undergo, the way must be shown to him without depriving him of his free will. The door of the intelligence must remain open, and its freedom must not be snatched from its hand. But if miracles had occurred in so apparent a way, intelligence would have had no choice. Abu Jahal would have believed, as did Abu Bakr. Coal would have had the value of diamonds, and no purpose would have remained for testing and accountability. It is a source of amazement that while thousands of men of different character came to believe through observing a single of his miracles, a single proof of his prophethood, or a word of his, or through merely seeing his face, some wretches are nowadays going astray, as if those thousands of proofs of his prophethood were not sufficient evidence, although they all have come down to us through authentic transmission and with certain proofs, and have caused many thousands of exacting scholars and thinkers and different men to accept faith. Second principle. Allah's most noble messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, was a human being. Hence, he acted like a human being. He was also a messenger and prophet, and with regard to his messengership, he was an interpreter and an envoy of Almighty Allah. His messengership was based upon revelation, which is of two kinds. The first is explicit revelation. In this case, the noble messenger is merely an interpreter and announcer, with no share in the content. The Qur'an and some sacred hadith are included in this kind of revelation. The second is implicit revelation. The essence and summary of this is also based on revelation or inspiration, but its explanation and description were left to the messenger. When he explained and described such revelation, sometimes he again relied on revelation or on inspiration, or sometimes he spoke in terms of his own insight. And, when he resorted to his own interpretation, he either relied on the perceptive power given him on account of his prophetic mission, or he spoke as a human being and conformably to usage, custom, and the level of common comprehension. Thus, all the details of every hadith are not necessarily derived from pure revelation, nor should the lofty marks of messengership be sought in such thoughts and transactions of his as are required by his participation in the human state. Since some truths were revealed to him in a brief and abstract form, and he himself described them in the light of his insight and according to common comprehension, the metaphors and allusions in his descriptions sometimes may need explanation or even interpretation. There are indeed some truths that the human mind can grasp only by way of comparison. For example, once in the presence of the prophet, a loud noise was heard. The prophet said, This is the noise of a rock that has been rolling down for 70 years and has now reached the lowest depths of hell. An hour later, the news came that a famous dissembler who had recently turned 70 years old had died and gone to hell. Thus, explaining the event the prophet had described by means of of an eloquent comparison. Third principle. If any related tradition is in the form of tawattur, it is indisputable. There are two kinds of this sort of report. One is those reports about which there is explicit consensus. The other is consensus in meaning. The latter is also of two kinds. The first includes those concerning which the consensus is implied by silence. For example, if a man in a community relates an incident in front of his people and the listeners do not contradict him, that is, they respond to him by keeping silent, 
This implies their acceptance of the report. In particular, if that community is such as will not accept any error, as will consider any lie reprehensible, as is ready to criticize and, in addition, shows an interest in the reported incident, the silence of that community testifies strongly to the incident having occurred. The second kind of consensus in meaning is that which occurs when different people relate a particular incident. For example, one oka of food fed 200 people. In different versions, one person describes in one way, another in another way, and another in yet another way. But all are unanimously agreed on the occurrence of the incident. Thus, the occurrence of this certain incident is supported by consensus in meaning and is definite. Its actual occurrence is not harmed by differences in detail. But apart from this, there are times when a report supplied by a single person expresses the certainty of consensus under certain conditions. It also sometimes happens that single report expresses certainty when supported by other outside evidences. Most of the reports concerning the miracles and the evidences of the prophethood of the most noble messenger alayhi salatu wassalam that have come down to us are either of the category of explicit consensus or consensus in meaning or consensus implied by silence. As for the others, although they are the report of a single person, they also have the certainty of consensus as they have received the acceptance of the meticulous authorities on hadith. Of such meticulous authorities were those geniuses who are called al hafiz who had committed to memory at least 100,000 hadiths, who offered for 50 years their morning prayer with the ablution of the night prayer, and who produced the six accurate books of hadith headed by those of Bukhari and Muslim. Without doubt, any report scrutinized and accepted by them cannot fall short of the certainty of consensus. For they acquired such intimacy with the hadiths of the noble prophet alayhi salatu wassalam and became so familiar with his exalted style and manner that they could spot at first sight a single false hadith among a hundred reports and would reject it saying, this cannot be a prophetic tradition, it does not have his wording. Since they were able to recognize the precious quality of the hadith like an expert jeweler, there was no possibility of their confusing any other word with that of the Prophet. Some researchers, however, such as Ibn al Jawzi, went to such excesses in their criticism as to regard many accurate traditions as false. Nevertheless, this does not mean that the meaning of every false wording is wrong. Rather, it means that the wording itself is not that of the Prophet. Question. What is the benefit of citing the chain of transmission of a tradition so that even if it is not called for in the case of a well-known incident, they say, so-and-so informed so-and-so, etc.? Answer. Its benefits are many, and one is that the citing of the chain shows the occurrence of the truthful, reliable, and exacting scholars of Hadith and the unanimity of the discerning authorities whose names are included. Each of the scholars and authorities signs, as it were, for the accuracy of the tradition and places his seal on it. Question. Why were the miraculous events not transmitted through numerous chains in the form of consensus and with as great emphasis as the basic injunctions of the sacred law, the Sharia? Answer. Because the majority of the injunctions of the Sharia are needed by most people at most times, for they all are applicable to each individual, like an obligation incumbent on all. But not everyone needs to know of every miracle. Even if he does, it suffices him to hear it only once. It is, in fact, like the kind of obligation, the observance of which by some will absolve the rest. It is quite enough for miracles to be known only to some. For this reason, even if the occurrence and reality of a miracle is ten times more certain than that of an injunction of the Sharia, it will still come to us through one or two narrators, whereas the injunction is narrated by 10 or 20 persons. Fourth principle. The future events that the most noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, predicted were not isolated incidents. 
He'd rather predicted general and recurring events in a particular way. That is, in each such report, he displayed a different aspect of one phenomenon out of several. This is why when the narrator combines these different aspects, they may seem at variance with reality. There are, for example, varying narrations concerning the Mahdi, each with different details and descriptions. However, as was explained in the section of the 24th word, the noble messenger gave the tidings, relying on revelation, of a Mahdi who would come in every century to preserve the morale of the believers, help them not to fall into despair in the face of disasters, and link the hearts of the believers with the people of the Prophet's family, who constitute a luminous chain in the world of Islam. Similar to the great Mahdi, who was promised to come at the end of time, one Mahdi from the Prophet's family, or more, has been found in every century. Indeed, one of them, found among the Abbasid caliphs who are descendants of the Prophet's family, was found to have many of the characteristics of the great Mahdi. In this way, the attributes of the Mahdi's deputies and of the spiritual poles who are Mahdi's, who were to precede the great Mahdi and were samples and forerunners of him, were confused with the attributes of the great Mahdi himself and the narrations concerning him were seen to conflict with one another. Fifth Principle Since none other than Allah knows the unseen, the noble messenger والسلام, could not know it himself. Instead, Allah Almighty communicated to him the tidings of the unseen, and he made them known. And since Almighty Allah is all wise and compassionate, his wisdom and mercy require that most of the matters of the unseen be veiled or obscure. For in this world, events disagreeable to human beings are numerous. Prior knowledge of their happening would be painful. It is for this reason that death and the appointed hour of death are left obscure, and the calamities that are to befall human beings remain behind the veil of the unseen. Again, as a result of his wisdom and mercy, Allah Almighty did not entirely or in detail inform his messenger about the dreadful events that would befall his family and companions after his demise. In order not to hurt his extremely tender compassion for his community and his firm affection for his family. For certain divine purposes, he made some of these significant events known to him, but not in all their awesomeness. As for pleasant events, he communicated them to the messenger, sometimes in outline and sometimes in detail, and the messenger in turn made them known to his companions. Thus, those tidings were accurately transmitted to us by the scholars of Hadith, who were at the height of piety, justice, and truthfulness, and who feared very much the warning of the Hadith. Whoever knowingly tells a lie concerning me, should prepare for a seat in hell, and that of the Quranic verse, who then does more wrong than the one who utters a lie concerning Allah? Sixth Principle Although some qualities and aspects of the Most Noble Messenger والسلام, have been described in books of history and biography, most of those qualities relate to his humanness. But in reality, the spiritual personality and the sacred nature of this blessed being are so exalted and luminous that the qualities described in books fall short of his high stature. For according to the rule, the cause is like the doer. Every day, even at this moment, the amount of the worship performed by all his community is being added to the record of his perfections. He is also every day the object of the countless supplications of his vast community, in addition to being the object of infinite divine mercy in an infinite fashion and with an infinite capacity to receive. He is indeed the result and the most perfect fruit of the universe, the interpreter and the beloved of the creator of the cosmos. Hence his true nature in its entirety and the truth of all his perfections cannot be contained in the human qualities recorded in books of history and biography. Certainly, the stature of a blessed being with the archangels Jibril and Mikael as two aides de camp at his side in the battle of Badr 
is not to be found in the form of a person bargaining with a Bedouin in the marketplace over the price of a horse, bringing forth Khuzaymah as his sole witness. In order not to proceed in error, one should raise his head beyond the ordinary qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that pertain to his participation in the human state, and behold instead his true nature and luminous stature that pertain to the rank of messengership. Otherwise, one will either show him irreverence or instill doubts in oneself. Heed the following comparison for an understanding of this mystery. Suppose that a seed of the date tree was planted under the earth, has sprouted and become a large, fertile tree, and is still continuing to grow taller and broader. Or that the egg of a peacock was incubated, a chick was hatched from it, and became a beautifully adorned peacock, gilded all over with the imprint of power, and is still growing bigger and more beautiful. Now, there exist qualities properties and precisely balanced elements that belong to the seed and the egg, but are not as great and significant as those of the tree and the bird that emerge from them. So, while describing the qualities of the tree and the bird together with those of the seed and the egg, one should turn one's attention from the seed to the tree and from the egg to the bird, so that one's reason may find the description acceptable. Otherwise, if you claim, I have obtained thousands of dates from a seed, or this egg is the king of all birds, you will invite others to contradict and deny your words. The humanness of Allah's Messenger may be likened to the seed or egg, and his essential nature, illumined with the function of messengership, to the tuba tree of paradise, or to the birds of paradise. His essential nature is, moreover, continually moving to greater perfection. That is why, when you think of the man who disputed in the market with a Bedouin, you should also turn the eye of imagination to that luminous being who, riding the Rafraf, leaving Jibril behind, reached the distance of two bowstrings. Otherwise, you will either be disrespectful toward him or fail to convince the evil commanding soul. Fifth sign. We will cite in this sign a few examples of hadiths concerning the matters of the unseen. It has come down to us, through an authentic chain of transmission at the degree of consensus, that the noble prophet declared from the pulpit in the presence of his companions, This my grandson, Hassan, is a master of men, by means of whom Allah will reconcile two great groups. Forty years later, when the two largest armies of Islam met each other, Hassan made peace with Muawiyah and thus proved the prophecy of his noble grandfather, alayhi salatu was salam. According to another authentic narration, the Prophet said to Ali, You will fight the perfidious, the just, and the deviator, thus predicting the battles of the camel and Sifin, and that fought against the Kharijites. He again said to Ali, when he was displaying love for Zubair, He will fight against you, but will be in the wrong. He also said to his wives, One among you will take charge of a rebellion. Many around her will be killed, and the dogs will bark all around her. All these certain and authentic traditions were the proven predictions of the struggles of Ali against Aisha, Zubair, and Talha, during the Battle of the Camel, against Muawiyah at Sifin, and against the Kharijites at Haraura and Nahrawan. The Prophet wasallam, also informed Ali about a man who would stain Ali's beard with the blood of his own head. Ali knew the man. It was Abdul Rahman bin Muljam the Kharijite. He also mentioned a man marked with a peculiar sign. Thudia. 
When the man was found among the dead of the Hadajites, Ali showed him as a proof of the rightness of his cause, declaring at the same time the miracle of the Prophet. According to another authentic tradition related by Umm Salama and others, the noble Prophet also predicted that Hussein would be killed at Taf, Karbala. Fifty years later, the painful event took place as predicted. He also repeatedly predicted that after his demise, his family would face death, calamities, and exile, and gave some details. What he had predicted later came true exactly. In this connection, a question may be asked. Although Ali, with his extraordinary bravery and profound knowledge, in addition to his kinship to Allah's messenger, greatly deserved to be caliph, why did he not precede others in holding the caliphate? And why did Islam experience such disorder during his caliphate? Answer A great spiritual poll from the Prophet's family is reported as saying, The noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, had desired that Ali be caliph, but it was made known to him from the unseen that the will of Allah Almighty was different. He then abandoned his desire, submitting himself to Allah's will. One of the reasons why Allah's will was different could have been that after the demise of the Prophet wasallam, when the companions were more than ever in need of alliance and unity, if Ali had taken the leadership, this would most probably have aroused in many persons and tribes a tendency to compete because of his uncompromising nature and fearless, ascetic, heroic, an independent character, and widely known courage, as was the case during his caliphate, and divisions among the believers would have resulted. Another reason for the delay of Ali's caliphate is the following. At the time of his caliphate, the Muslim community, which had rapidly developed through the intermingling of many tribes and peoples, possessed such traits as reflected the opinions of the 73 sects that the noble prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had predicted would evolve in due time therefore in the face of such disturbances someone was then needed with the wondrous strength courage respectability and sagacity of ali someone having the force of the respected hashemites and the prophet's family so that he could resist the sedition. And indeed he did so, in a fashion conformable to the prediction of the Prophet, who had said to him, I have fought for the revelation of the Qur'an, you will fight for its explanation. A further reason for this delay is that without Ali, worldly rule would most probably have caused the Umayyad kings to go completely astray. However, being confronted with Ali and the Prophet's family, and having to appear equal to them and to preserve their prestige before the Muslims, all the leaders of the Umayyad dynasty, even if not they themselves, in any event due to their encouragement and recommendations, their followers and supporters worked with all their strength to preserve and disseminate the truths of Islam and belief and the Quranic decrees. Thus, they produced thousands of punctilious interpreters of the law and authorities on hadith and saints and purified scholars. Had they not been faced by the strong religiosity, sainthood, and virtuousness of Ali and of the Prophet's family, it is possible that the Umayyads would from the very beginning have gone completely astray, as happened at the end of their rule and as did the Abbasids. It might also be asked, why did the Islamic Caliphate not remain in the Prophet's family since they were the most deserving and fitted for it? The answer, worldly rule is deceptive and the Prophet's family had been appointed to preserve the decrees of the Quran and the truths of Islam. Not to be deceived by power, the one who was to hold it and the Caliphate had to be as sinless as a Prophet or as pure-hearted and unworldly as the four rightly guided caliphs, Umar bin Abdul Aziz and the Mahdi of the Abbasids. In fact, the caliphate of the Fatimid dynasty, which was founded in the name of the Prophet's family in Egypt, and the rule of the Almohads in Africa, 
and the Safavid dynasty in Iran showed that worldly rule was not suitable for the Prophet's family, for it caused them to neglect their primary duty, the protection of religion and the service of Islam. When, on the other hand, they gave up worldly rule, they brilliantly and most successfully served Islam and the Qur'an. Now see, of the poles of sainthood descended from Hassan, especially the four poles. Note the four poles of sainthood, namely Abdul Qadir Gilani, Ahmed Rufai, Ahmed Badawi, and Ibrahim Dasuki. Now see, of the poles of sainthood descended from Hassan, especially the four poles, and above all, Abdul Qadir Gilani, and the imams of Hussein's line, especially Zayn al Abidin and Jafa al Sadiq, each became like a spiritual Mahdi, dispelled wrongdoing and spiritual darkness, and spread the light of the Quran and the truths of belief. And in so doing, each showed he was a true heir of his noble forefather. It may then be asked, what was the wisdom in the awesome and bloody dissension that was visited on blessed Islam and the luminous age of bliss? And what aspect of mercy was there in it, for they did not deserve such distress? The answer, just as a heavy spring rainstorm stirs into action the potentialities of all the varieties of plants, seeds, and trees, and causes them to develop, so each blossoms in its particular way and performs the duties inherent in its nature, so too, the dissension visited on the companions and their successors stirred their potentialities into action, which were all different and like seeds. It spurred them on, exclaiming, Islam is in danger, fire, fire. It put fear into all the groups and made them hasten to protect Islam. According to its abilities, each of the groups shouldered one of the numerous different duties of the Islamic community and strove in utmost earnestness some working for the preservation of the prophetic hadiths, some for the preservation of the sharia, some for the preservation of the truths of belief, some for the preservation of the Qur'an, and so on. Each group undertook a particular duty. They strove in performing the duties of Islam. Numerous, multicolored flowers opened, and through the storm, seeds were cast to all the corners of the most extensive world of Islam. Half the earth was transformed into a rose garden. But sadly, together with the roses, the thorns of the deviant sects appeared in the garden. It was as if the hand of power had shaken that error in wrath, rotated it with intense vigor, and electrified the men of zeal. Through the centrifugal force of that movement, a great many enlightened interpreters of the law, luminous scholars of hadith, holy memorizers of the Qur'an, gifted scholars, men of purity, and poles of sainthood were flung off and caused to emigrate to the remote corners of the world of Islam. It fired with enthusiasm all the people of Islam from east to west and awakened them to the treasures of the Qur'an. Now we return to our subject. There are thousands of events that Allah's noble messenger والسلام, predicted and that happened as he foretold. Here we shall mention a few of them. The majority of those we will cite are agreed upon by the six well-known and most authentic books of Hadith, particularly by Bukhari and Muslim. There is consensus in meaning concerning the reports, while others, on account of being verified by meticulous researchers, may also be considered to have this certainty. According to an authentic and certain narration, the noble prophet والسلام, said to his companions, You will be victorious over all your enemies, will succeed in the conquest of Mecca, Khaybar, Damascus, and Iraq, Persia, and Jerusalem, and will share among yourselves the treasures of the rulers of the greatest empires, the Byzantines and the Persians. He did not say this as a matter of conjecture or personal opinion. He said it as if he had seen it. And what he said came true, as predicted. This was despite the fact that at the time he foretold this, he had to migrate to Medina with a handful of followers, with the rest of the world, including the environs of Medina, hostile to him. 
He also repeatedly declared, according to authentic and certain narrations, that Abu Bakr and Umar would outlive him and be his caliphs, that they would act for Allah's sake and within the bounds of the pleasure of Allah and that of the Prophet, that Abu Bakr's rule would be short and that Umar would remain a long time to succeed in many conquests. Thus he said, Incumbent upon you is following the path of those who come after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. He also declared, The earth was laid out before me, and its eastern and western extremities were displayed to me. The realm of my community shall extend over whatever was laid out before me. And his words proved true. According to an authentic and certain narration, before the Battle of Badr, he pointed out one by one the places where the leaders of the Quraysh would be killed, saying, Abu Jah will be killed here, Utbah here, Umayyah here, etc. And added, I shall kill Ubay bin Khalaf with my own hands. His predictions all proved to be true. Again, according to an authentic and certain narration, he informed his companions about what was happening in the celebrated battle of Mu'ta, near Damascus, at a distance of one month's journey from where he was, as if he was seeing his companions fighting in the battle and said, Zayd has taken the banner and been struck. Now Ibn Rawaha has taken the banner and been struck. Now Jafar has taken the banner and been struck. Now one of Allah's swords, i.e. Khalid, has taken it. Two to three weeks later, Ya'la bin Munabbe returned from the battlefront. In his presence, the noble prophet described the details of the battle, and Ya'la swore by Allah that what had taken place at the battle was exactly the same as the prophet had described. According to an authentic and certain narration, the noble messenger wasalam, said, After me, the caliphate will last thirty years. Then it will be rapacious monarchy. The beginning of this affair is prophethood and mercy. Then it will be mercy and caliphate. Then it will be rapacious monarchy. Then it will be arrogance and tyranny. He thus predicted the six-month-long caliphate of Hassan and the period of the four rightly guided caliphs and following that the transition of caliphate to monarchy and monarchies being beset by intrigues and tyranny. This is exactly what later occurred. Again, according to an authentic narration, he declared, Uthman will be killed while reading the Qur'an, and it may be said that Allah will cause him to be dressed in a shirt at that time. His deposal may also be sought. These events, too, all took place exactly as predicted. Also, according to an authentic narration, while cupping the Prophet wasallam, Abdullah bin Zubair tasted his blessed blood. And then the Prophet said, Woe unto the people, for what shall befall them at your hands? And woe unto you, for what shall befall you at their hands? Predicting that Abdullah would lead the Muslims with extraordinary bravery, would face terrible attacks and that because of him, fearsome events would befall people. What he foretold came about exactly. During Umayyad rule, Abdullah bin Zubair declared his caliphate in Mecca, heroically fought in many battles until finally Hajjaj the tyrant attacked him with a large force, and following a fierce battle, the illustrious hero was martyred. Again, according to an authentic narration, he foretold the characteristics of the Umayyad dynasty and the tyrannical rule of many of its monarchs, including Yazid and Walid, and Muawiyah's taking the leadership of the Muslims. He advised justice and gentleness and said, When ruling, act with forbearance. He predicted that the Abbasid dynasty would emerge after the Umayyads to remain in power for a long time and said, The Abbasids will come forth with black banners and rule for much longer than they, the Umayyads rule. All these predictions proved to be true. According to an authentic narration, the noble messenger wasalam, also said, Woe to the Arabs for the evil that has drawn near, suggesting the dreadful disorders to be caused by Genghis and Hulagu and their destruction of the Abbasid state. All this proved to be true. 
According to an authentic narration, when Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas was gravely ill, the Prophet said to him, It may be that you will be spared so that some may benefit by you and others harmed by you, thus predicting that he would be a great commander winning many victories and many peoples would benefit from him entering the fold of Islam, while others would be destroyed by him. His words proved to be true. Sa'ad led the Muslim armies, wiped out the Persian Empire, and caused many peoples to reach guidance, the path of Islam. Also, according to an authentic narration, when the Negus, the Abyssinian ruler, who had accepted faith earlier, died in the seventh year of the Hijra, Allah's Prophet والسلام, informed his companions about it. He even performed funeral prayers for him. One week later came the news confirming the death of the Negus on the very same day as the Prophet had said. According to an authentic narration, when the noble Prophet was with his closest four companions on the top of Mount Uhud or Hira, the mountain began to tremble. He said, Steady, for on you are a prophet, a voracious one, Siddiq, and a martyr, and foretold the martyrdom of Umar, Uthman, and Ali. It too proved true. Now, O oh, unfortunate, wretched man without heart, who says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was only a clever person and then closes his eyes to the sun of truth, of all his 15 different kinds of miracle, you have thus far heard only the hundredth part of one kind, that relating to his predictions, which have the certainty of consensus in meaning. To discover future events through one's own sagacity, and thus succeed even in one hundredth part of the prophet's predictions, one would have to be of the highest genius. Even if we merely called him a genius, as you call him, could such a man with the sagacity of a hundred geniuses have ever seen anything wrongly? Or could he have ever stooped to reporting it wrongly? Not to heed the word of such a hundredfold genius concerning happiness in both worlds is therefore the sign of a hundredfold madness. Sixth sign. According to an authentic narration, the noble messenger والسلام, said to Fatima, You will be the first of my family to join me after my death. Six months later, what he said took place. He also told Abu Dar, You will be expelled from here, Medina. We'll live alone and we'll die alone. All this came true twenty years later. Once, as he awakened in the house of Anas bin Malik's aunt, Umm Haram, he smilingly said, I saw my community waging war on the seas like kings sitting on thrones. Umm Haram requested, Pray that I too will be with them. He said, You shall be. Forty years later, she accompanied her husband, Ubada bin Samit, on the conquest of Cyprus. She died there, and her grave has ever since been visited by the believers. Thus what the Prophet foretold proved to be true. Also according to an authentic narration he declared, From the tribe of Thaqif a liar will claim prophethood, and a bloodthirsty tyrant will appear. With this he gave tidings of the infamous Mukhtar, who claimed prophethood, and of the barbarous Hajjaj, who killed a hundred thousand people. According to an authentic narration he said, Istanbul will be conquered, and blessed are the ruler and the troops that will conquer it. He thus gave tidings that Istanbul would be conquered by Muslim hands, and that Mehmed the conqueror would attain a high spiritual rank. His prediction again proved to be true. He also said, according to an authentic narration, were religion to be hung on the Pleiades, men from Persia would reach up and lay hold of it indicating that matchless scholars and saints like Abu Hanifa would emerge from Iran. In addition, he foretold Imam Shafi'i saying, a scholar from Quraysh 
who will fill all regions of the earth with learning. According to an authentic narration, he said, my community will be divided into 73 sects, and only one among them will attain salvation. He was asked, who are they? He replied, those who follow me and my companions, meaning the Sunnis or Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. He also declared, the Qadariya are the Magians of this community, foretelling the emergence of the Qadariya sect, which would be divided into different branches and reject divine determining or destiny. He also foretold the Rafida, who would produce various offshoots. Again, according to an authentic narration, he said to Ali, as was true of Isa, two groups of people will perish on your account, one because of excessive love, the other because of excessive enmity. Christians, on account of the deep love for Isa, transgressed the limits and called him Astaghfirullah, the son of Allah, while the Jews, because of their hostility, went to another extreme by denying his message and virtue. Similarly, some will also incur loss through their exaggerated affection towards you. For them is the insulting name of Rafida, and certain others will be excessively hostile to you. They are the Kharijites and the extremist partisans of the Umayyads, who will be called Nasiba. It may be asked here, Love for the Prophet's family is a command of the Qur'an and was greatly encouraged by the Prophet. The affection of the Shia may therefore serve as an excuse for them since deep affection may be likened to intoxication. Why then can the Shia, especially the Rafida, not benefit from their love? And why is their love described by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as transgression? The answer Love is of two kinds. The first is to love something or someone for the meaning it or he signifies. This means to love Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and the Prophet's family in the name of Allah and of his Messenger. This kind of love augments the love of the Prophet and becomes a means to love Allah Almighty. Thus it is permissible and its excess is not harmful or aggressive nor does it call for reproach and hostility towards others. The second kind of love takes the means as the object. It is to love something or someone for itself or himself. In it, one does not think of the Prophet wasallam, but devotes one's love to Ali on account of his bravery and to Hassan and Hussein on account of their greatness and lofty qualities no matter if one knows the Prophet or recognizes Allah. This love is not a means of love for Allah and His Prophet. Besides, when excessive, it results in censure and enmity for others. It is on account of this kind of love that such people held themselves at a distance from Abu Bakr and Umar and fell into loss. Their negative love, indeed, is the source of misfortune. According to an authentic narration, Allah's most noble messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, declared, When Persian and Roman girls serve you, then calamity and misfortune will be with you, and your struggles will be between yourselves with the wicked preying on the virtuous. After thirty years his predictions came true. Again, according to an authentic narration, he declared, the fortress of Khaybar will be conquered at Ali's hand as a miracle of his prophethood and beyond all expectation the following day Ali ripped off the gate of the fortress of Khaybar used it as a shield and seized the fortress when he threw it aside after the conquest eight strong men or according to another version 40 tried to lift it but could not do so the noble messenger والسلام, also predicted the battle of Sifin between Ali and Muawiyah, saying, The hour shall not come until two parties with a single claim fight each other. He also declared that a group of rebels would kill Ammar. When Ammar was killed at the battle of Sifin, 
Ali cited this as a proof that Muawiyah's followers were rebellious. But Muawiyah interpreted it differently. And also, Amr bin al-As said, The rebels are murderers, not all of us. The noble prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also said, As long as Umar is alive, no sedition will erupt among you. And so it happened. Before accepting faith, Sal bin Amr was once captured in a battle. Umar said to Allah's messenger, Allow me to pull out his teeth, for he, with his eloquent speech, incited the idolatrous Quraysh to wage war against us. Allah's messenger replied, It may be that he will assume a stance pleasing to you, O Umar. In fact, at the time of the Prophet's demise, which caused panic and agitation, Sal, with his well-known eloquence, calmed and comforted the companions in Mecca with an address, while in Medina, Abu Bakr, with his great firmness, was also giving a very important address to comfort the companions. Surprisingly, the two addresses resemble each other in regard to their wording. To Suraqa, the Prophet once said, You will wear the two bracelets of Chosros. Chosros was wiped out during the Caliphate of Umar. When Chosros' jewelry arrived, Umar put the bracelets on Suraqa, saying, Praise be to Allah who took these off Chosros and put them on Suraqa. This confirmed the report of the Prophet. The noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, also declared, Once Chosros, the Persian, has gone, there will be no other. So it turned out. He once said to Chosros' envoy, Chosros has now been killed by his son, Shervia Parviz. Upon investigating and finding out that he has indeed been murdered at that very time, the envoy accepted Islam. The name of the envoy occurs in some narrations as Firuz. According to an authentic narration, the noble prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once mentioned a secret letter that Khatib bin Balta'a had sent to the Quraysh. He sent Ali and Miqdad to fetch it, saying, There is a person at such and such a location bearing such and such a letter. Take it and bring it here. They went and brought exactly the letter he had described from exactly the place. The Prophet wasallam summoned Khatib and asked him why he had done it. Khatib apologized and the Prophet pardoned him. Again, according to an authentic narration concerning Utbah bin Abi Lahab, Allah's Messenger prayed, May he be eaten by one of the dogs of Allah, predicting the terrible fate of Utbah. For while on his way to the Yemen, Utbah was devoured by a lion. Both the maldiction and the prediction of the Prophet were thus confirmed. At the conquest of Mecca, as is also related in an authentic narration, Bilal al-Habashi went up onto the roof of the Kaaba and made the call to prayer, while Abu Sufyan, Atta bin Asid, and Harith bin Hisham from among the leaders of the Quraysh were sitting together nearby. Atab said, My father was fortunate enough not to witness this moment. Hadith said contemptuously about Bilal, Could Muhammad have not found someone other than this black crow to make the muezzin? Abu Sufyan said, I'm afraid to say anything, for he will come to know of whatever I say. Even if nothing else informs him, the rocks of this Batha, Mecca, will do so. Indeed, a little later, the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, encountered them and repeated to them their conversation, word for word. That very moment, Attab and Harith became Muslims. See, wretched denier who does not recognize the Prophet. Two stubborn leaders of the Quraysh came to believe on hearing this single report of his from the unseen. How corrupted your heart must be. For you hear about thousands of miracles having the certainty of consensus in meaning like this one, and still you are not completely satisfied. However, to return to our subject. According to an authentic narration, Abbas was captured by the companions in the Battle of Badr. When he was asked for ransom, he said he did not have money. Allah's Messenger والسلام, said to him, You and your wife Umfadl hid that much money. He gave the exact amount. 
in such and such a place. Abbas confirmed this saying, this was a secret known by only the two of us and became a Muslim. Also, according to an authentic narration, a dangerous Jewish sorcerer named Labid once concocted a strong and effective spell to harass Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He wrapped hair and thread around the comb, bewitched it, and threw it into a well. The noble messenger told his companions, including Ali, to go and bring the spell in the well, which they did, finding it exactly as described. As they unwrapped the hair, the messenger's discomfort lessened. Again, according to an authentic narration, the noble messenger once gave the news of the awesome fate of an apostate to a group that included such important persons as Abu Huraira and Hudayfa, saying, One of you will enter the fire with a tooth bigger than Mount Uhud. Abu Huraira related, I was afraid, as later only two remained from that group, one of which was me. Finally, the other man was killed in the Battle of Yamama as one of the followers of Musaylima. The truth of the Prophet's Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prediction was thus confirmed. It is related through an authentic chain of reports that Umar and Safwan, before they became Muslims, once decided to kill the Prophet for a handsome reward that had been offered them. When Umar arrived in Medina with this intention, the noble messenger summoned him and putting his hand on Umair's chest, told him about what he had planned with Safwan. Umair answered, Yes, and became a Muslim. Like those mentioned above, many predictions which the noble messenger wasalam, gave concerning the unseen have been recorded in the six best-known authentic books of Hadith, together with the chains of the narrators. As for the occurrences related in this work, they are definite to the degree of consensus in meaning. Being related in Bukhari and Muslim, which are accepted by the scholars as the most authentic sources after the Qur'an, and in the other collections like Tirmidhi, Nasa'i, Abu Dawood, Mustadrak al-Hakim, Musnad al-Ahmed bin Hanbal, and Dala'il al-Bayhaqi. Now unthinking denier, do not shrug these off saying Muhammad the Arabian was clever because the accurate predictions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam concerning the unseen cannot be explained except in either of the following two ways. You will either suppose that this blessed person had such piercing vision and expansive genius that he saw and knew the past and the future and all the world, beheld the east, the west, and the whole universe, and discovered what happened in the past and what will happen in the future. Such a quality is not to be found in a human being, but if it was to be, it would certainly be a wonder, a gift, bestowed on him by the creator of the world, which would itself be the greatest of miracles. Or you will believe this blessed person to be an official and a student of one under whose disposal and observation everything stands, under whose command are all ages and all the species and realms of beings in the cosmos, in whose great ledger is recorded everything, so that he may show and communicate them to his student whenever he wishes. Thus, Muhammad the Arabian والسلام, instructs others as he himself is instructed by the Lord of pre-eternity. It is related in an authentic narration that when the Prophet appointed Khalid bin al-Walid to fight against Ukaidir, the head of the Dumat al-Jandal, he informed Khalid that he would find Ukaidir on a wild ox hunt and that he would be captured without resistance. Khalid captured Ukaidir in exactly this way. According to an authentic narration, when the Quraysh hung up on the wall of the Kaaba, a leaf on which were written words against the Bani Hashim, the Prophet said to them, Worms have eaten the leaf except the parts bearing the names of Allah. They examined the leaf to find it in the same condition as had been described. According to an authentic narration, the noble messenger والسلام, said, There will be a big epidemic during the conquest of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was conquered during the caliphate of Umar, a widespread epidemic caused in three days the death of about 70,000 people. Again, 
According to an authentic narration, the Prophet ﷺ predicted that Basra and Baghdad would come into existence, which at that time had not been founded, that the treasure of the world would enter Baghdad, and that the Turks and the people living on the shores of the Caspian Sea would do battle with the Arabs, and that the majority of them would later enter the fold of Islam, and that among the Arabs they would come to dominate them. He said, the Persians, non-Arabs, will almost predominate among you, consuming your booty and smiting you. He also said, the ruin of my community will be at the hands of the wicked ones from Quraysh, suggesting the disorder caused by the wicked leaders of the Umayyads, such as Walid and Yazid. He furthermore predicted that apostasy would take place in such areas as Yamama. During the famous battle of Khandaq, he declared, From now on, I will make assaults on the Quraysh and their confederates, not they on me. This was also verified. According to an authentic narration, he said a few months prior to his death, one of Allah's bondsmen has been given a choice and he chose that which is with Allah. About Zayd bin Suwahan, he said, one of his limbs will precede him to paradise. In the battle of Nihawand, one of his hands was martyred and in effect reached heaven first. The incidents we have so far mentioned concerning predictions relating to the unseen comprise only one out of his ten different kinds of miracle. Yet of this kind alone, we have not even mentioned one-tenth. In addition to what is mentioned here, four general kinds of miracle concerning predictions of the unseen have been described briefly in the 25th word, which is about the miraculousness of the Qur'an. Now consider the kinds mentioned here together with the four extensive sorts communicated from the unseen by the tongue of the Qur'an, you will see what conclusive, indisputable, sound, brilliant, and firm proof of his messengership they form. Indeed, anyone whose heart and mind are not corrupted will of a surety believe that Muhammad is the messenger of, and receives knowledge from, a glorious one who is the creator of all things, the one all-knowing of the unseen. Seventh Sign We will give in this sign a few examples from among the prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, miracles that relate to his effecting increase in food and that are definite to the degree of consensus in meaning. But before going into the subject, some introductory comments will be appropriate. Introduction Each of the following examples of miracles is narrated as authentic through various, sometimes as many as 16 chains of transmission. Most of them occurred in the presence of large assemblies and were narrated by many truthful persons of good repute from among those present. For example, from among 70 men who partook of four handfuls of food and were filled, one relates the incident and the others do not contradict him. Their silence thus indicates their confirmation. For if in that era of truth and truthfulness the companions who were lovers of the truth and earnest and honest had witnessed even the tiniest lie, they would have rejected and denied it. But the incidents we will be citing were narrated by many, and the others who witnessed them remained silent. Thus, each of these incidents has the certainty of consensus in meaning. Furthermore, books of both history and the Prophet's biography testify that next to the preservation of the Qur'an and its verses, the companions worked with all their strength to preserve the deeds and words of Allah's most noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, and especially those relating to the injunctions of the Sharia and to miracles, paying extreme attention to their accuracy. They never neglected even the tiniest aspect of his conduct, actions, and states. This and the fact that they recorded them is testified to by books of Hadith. 
In addition, in the era of bliss, they wrote down and recorded very many of the hadiths concerning the injunctions of the law and his miracles. The seven Abdullahs in particular recorded them in writing, and especially Abdullah bin al-Abbas, known as the interpreter of the Qur'an, and Abdullah bin Amr bin al-As, some 30 to 40 years later, and the thousands of exacting scholars of the generation that followed the companions recorded the hadiths and miracles in writing. And still later, chiefly, the four great interpreters of the law and thousands of exacting scholars of hadith related them and preserved them in writing. Then 200 years after the Hijrah, foremost Bukhari and Muslim, and the six accepted books of tradition undertook the duty of their preservation. Many severe critics, such as Ibn al-Jawzi, emerged who identified false reports which had been produced by deniers, the unthinking, the ignorant, or those who had recalled them wrongly. Later, learned and exacting scholars like Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, who 70 times was honored in a waking state by the presence and conversation of Allah's noble messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, differentiated the diamonds of authentic traditions from other sayings and fabrications. Thus, the incidents and miracles we shall speak of have come down to us through numerous, perhaps uncountable, strong and trustworthy hands and have reached us in sound condition. All praise be to Allah. This is from the bounty of my Lord. It is for this reason that one's mind should be freed from the notion that these incidents have been distorted or confused in any way in being passed down all the way from that time to the present. The first example of definite miracles concerning the Prophet's increase of food through his blessing. The six accurate books of tradition, Bukhari and Muslim included, unanimously relate that during the feast on the occasion of the Prophet's sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marriage to Zainab, Anas's mother, Umm Sulaim, prepared a dish by frying two handfuls of dates in oil and sent it with Anas to the Prophet. The noble Prophet told him, Go and invite so-and-so, naming some persons, and also invite whomever you encounter on your way. Anas invited those named and those he met. About 300 companions came and filled the Prophet's room and anteroom. Then the Prophet said, Make circles of ten. He placed his blessed hand on that little amount of food, uttered supplications, and told them to help themselves. All of them ate and was fully satisfied. Afterwards, the Prophet asked Anas to remove the food. Anas later related, I could not tell if there was more of it when I set it down or when I removed it. Second example, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the Prophet's host, relates that when the noble Prophet والسلام, honored his house, he had prepared a meal for two, which would suffice the Prophet and Abu Bakr. But the Prophet told him, invite 30 men from among the distinguished Ansar. Abu Ayyub said, 30 men came and ate. He then said, invite 60 men, which I did, and they also came and ate. The Prophet said again, invite 70 more. I invited them. They came. And when they finished eating, there was still food left in the bowls. All who came embraced Islam and took the oath of allegiance after witnessing this miracle. 180 men ate the food of two men. Third example. It is reported through many chains of transmission from Umar bin al-Khattab, Abu Huraira, Salma bin Akwa, Abu Amrat al-Ansari, and others that on one expedition, the army went hungry. They referred themselves to the noble prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and he told them, gather whatever food is left in your saddlebags. Everyone brought a few pieces of dates and put them on a mat. The most they could put together was four handfuls. Salama related, I estimated it amounted to the size of a sitting goat. Then the noble messenger alayhi salatu wasalam announced, Everyone bring his dish. They pressed forward, and no one in the whole army remained with an empty dish. All the dishes were filled. There was even some left over. One of the companions later said, 
I realized from the way that increase was obtained that if the whole world had come, the food still would have been sufficient. Fourth example. As recorded in all of the six books, including Bukhari and Muslim, Abdul Rahman bin Abu Bakr al-Siddiq relates, We, 130 companions, were with the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, on an expedition. Dough was prepared to the amount of about four handfuls. A goat was slaughtered and cooked, and its liver and kidneys were roasted. I swear by Allah that from that roasted meat, liver and kidneys, Allah's messenger gave a small piece to each and put the cooked meat into two large bowls. After we had all eaten until we were filled, there was still some left over, which I loaded onto a camel. Fifth example. As is recorded in the six books, Jabir al-Ansari related under oath, during the Ahzab expedition on the celebrated day of Khandak, about a thousand people ate from four handfuls of rye bread and a young cooked goat. Yet food was still left over. That day, the food had been cooked in my house, and after the one thousand people had left, the pot was still boiling with meat in it, and bread was being made from the dough. For the Prophet had wetted the dough and the pot with his blessed mouth, beseeching Allah for plenty. Sixth example. According to an authentic narration from Abu Talha, the uncle of Anas who served Allah's messenger, the messenger fed 70 to 80 men with the small amount of rye bread that Anas had brought under his arm. The messenger ordered, break the bread into small pieces and prayed for increase. Because the house was small, they came 10 at a time and left having filled themselves. Seventh example, it is related as authentic in accurate books such as Shifa al-Sharif and Muslim that Jabir al-Ansari related, once a man asked the noble messenger alayhi salatu wassalam for food for his household, the messenger gave him a half load of barley. For a long time he ate of the barley together with his family and guests. They would look and see that it did not finish, so they measured it to see by how much it decreased. After that, the blessing of abundance was gone and the barley began to dwindle rapidly. The man went to the messenger and related what had happened. Allah's messenger replied, If you had not put it to the test by measuring it, it would have lasted you a lifetime. Eighth example. According to accurate books, such as Tirmidhi, Nasai, Bayhaqi, and Shifa al-Sharif, Samura bin Jundub, related that a bowl of meat was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From morning to evening, many groups of men came and ate from it. In accordance with the explanation we gave in the introduction to this section, this is not the narration of Samura alone, since Samura narrated this incident on behalf of and with the approval of all those present. Ninth example. It is also narrated by reliable and trusted scholars such as the well-known author of Shifa al-Sharif, Ibn Abi Shayba, and Tabarani, that Abu Huraira related, The noble messenger commanded me, invite the poor Meccan migrants who have made the bench, Sufa, of the mosque their home, and who number more than a hundred. So I went and searched for them and gathered them together. A tray of food was set before us and we ate as much as we wanted. Then we arose. The dish remained full as it was when set down. Only the traces of fingers on the food were visible. Thus this incident is related by Abu Huraira in the name of all the people of the bench supported by their confirmation. Hence, the incident is as definite as if all the people of the bench had related it. Is it at all possible that if it had not been true, those men of truth and perfection would have remained silent and not denied it? Tenth example, according to an authentic narration from Ali, the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, once gathered the Bani Abdul Mutalib. They were about forty, including some who would eat a young camel and drink a gallon of milk in one meal. Yet for them, he had prepared only a handful of food. All ate and were satisfied, and the food remained just as it had been before. Later, he brought milk in a wooden bowl that would have been sufficient for only three or four persons. They all drank their fill. 
thus a miracle of plenty as definite as Ali's courage and loyalty. Eleventh example. According to an authentic narration, on the occasion of Ali's marriage to Fatima al-Zahra, the noble messenger والسلام, ordered Bilal al-Habashi, have bread made from a few handfuls of flour, also slaughter a young camel. Bilal relates, I brought the food and he put his hand on it to bless it. Later the companions arrived in groups, ate and left. From the remaining food he sent a full bowl to each of his wives, saying that they should eat and feed anyone who visited them. Such blessed plenty was indeed necessary for such a blessed marriage. Twelfth example, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq related from his father Muhammad al-Baqir and he from his father Zain al-Abidin and he from Ali that Fatima al-Zahra had prepared enough food for herself and Ali. She then sent Ali to invite the noble messenger والسلام, to come and eat with them. Allah's messenger came and told them to send a dish of food to each of his wives. Fatima said that after a dish of food had been set aside for himself, Ali, Fatima and their children, they lifted up the saucepan and it was full to overflowing. Through Allah's will, they ate of the food for a long time afterwards. Why do you not believe this miracle of increase just as if you had witnessed it with your own eyes, since it comes from this luminous, elevated chain of transmission? Satan himself could find no excuse in the face of this one. Thirteenth example. Voracious authorities such as Abu Dawood, Ahmed bin Hanbal, and Bayhaqi narrate from Dukain al Ahmasi bin Sa'id al Muzain and from Nu'man bin Muqadrin al Ahmasi al Muzain, who with his six brothers was honored with the Prophet's conversation and was a companion, and by way of Jarir through numerous chains of transmission from Umar bin al Khattab that Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, ordered Umar bin al Khattab, equipped with provisions for a journey, 400 horsemen from the Ahmasi tribe. Umar replied, O Messenger of Allah, what we have in hand is the equivalent of a seated young camel. The Messenger said, Go and give it to them. So he went, and out of that half load of dates, gave the 400 horsemen sufficient provisions, and he stated that it remained as before, without diminishing. Thus this miracle of plenty occurred in connection with 400 men and Umar in particular. They are behind the narrations supporting them, and their silence confirms them. Do not ignore these narrations because they are related by a few individuals only. For if the incident had only been reported by a single individual, it still would have the certainty of consensus and meaning. Fourteenth example. All the accurate books of tradition, and foremost Bukhari and Muslim, narrate that when Jabir's father died, he was heavily in debt. His creditors were Jews. Jabir offered the creditors all his father's possessions, but they did not accept them. The fruit produced by his orchard over many years would have been insufficient to defray the debt. The noble messenger والسلام, said, Pick and gather in all the fruit in the orchard. They did so. Then the noble messenger walked around the crop and prayed. Then Jabir gave from the amount corresponding to his father's debt. What was left was as much as the annual produce of the orchard, and according to another narration, it was equal to the amount he gave the creditors. The Jews were amazed and astounded at this. See, this clear miracle of plenty was not only reported by a few narrators like Jabir. Many people connected with it described and narrated it, thus giving it the degree of consensus in meaning. Fifteenth example. Exact scholars and foremost Tunmidi and Imam Bayhaqi related through a sound chain of authorities from Abu Huraira that Abu Huraira said during one expedition, that of Tabuk, according to another narration, the army went hungry. Allah's noble messenger والسلام, asked, Is there nothing? I said, I have one or two dates in my saddlebag. According to another narration, it was 15. He said, Bring them here. 
I took them to him, and he plunged his hand into them and took a handful. He put them into a dish and offered a supplication for their increase. Then he called the men in groups of ten, and they all ate of them. Then he said, Take what you brought, hold it, and do not turn it upside down. I put my hand in the bag. There were in my hands as many dates as I had brought. Later, during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those of Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, I ate of those dates. It is narrated through another chain of transmission. I gave several loads of those dates to be used in Allah's way. Later the bag containing the dates was plundered when Uthman was assassinated. Abu Huraira was a constant and important student and disciple among the people of the bench, the sacred school and tekke of the teacher of the universe, the pride of the world, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In addition, the Prophet had prayed for his strength of memory. The miracle of plenty he reported which occurred in a large gathering like the expedition of Tabuk should therefore be as sound and certain as the word of a whole army. Sixteenth example. Foremost, Bukhari and the accurate books relate, through an authentic narration, that once Abu Huraira was hungry, so he followed the noble messenger alayhi salatu wassalam into his house. There they saw that a cup of milk had been brought as a gift. Allah's messenger said to him, Call all the people of the bench. Abu Huraira relates, I said to myself, I could drink all the milk myself as I was most in need of it. But since it was Allah's messenger's order, I fetched the people of the bench who numbered more than a hundred. Allah's messenger told me to offer milk to them. I gave the cup to each, one by one, and each drank until satisfied. At the end, the messenger told me, the rest is for me and you. As I drank, Allah's messenger kept telling me to drink more until I said, I swear by the glorious one who sent you with the truth that I am too full to drink any more. Then Allah's messenger drank the rest, invoking the name of Allah and offering him thanks. May it be a blessing for him a hundred thousand times. This indubitable, manifest miracle, as pure and sweet as milk itself, is related by all six books with their sound narrations and foremost Bukhari, who committed to memory 500,000 hadiths. Moreover, it is narrated by a celebrated, loyal and brilliant student of the Prophet's blessed school of the bench, Abu Huraira, who also cited as witness, rather, represented all the other students of the bench. Therefore, not to regard such a report as having the certainty of consensus, either one's heart should be corrupted or one's brain destroyed. Is it ever possible that such a truthful person as Abu Huraira, who devoted all his life to the Prophet's hadiths and to religion, and who heard and himself transmitted the hadith, whoever knowingly tells a lie concerning me should prepare for a seat in hellfire, should have related an unfounded incident or saying that would have made him the target of the contradiction of the people of the bench? and that would have caused doubt concerning the value and soundness of all the other hadiths he had memorized. Allah forbid. O oh, our sustainer, for the sake of the blessings you bestowed on your most noble messenger, bestow the blessings of abundance on the favors with which you have provided us. An important point. It is well known that when assembled together, weak things become strong. Fine threads are twisted and they become a strong rope. Strong ropes are wound together and no one can break them. In this sign, we have shown from among 15 different kinds of miracles only one that related to the blessings of increase and plenty. And the 16 examples we have given constitute barely a 15th of this one kind. However, each of the examples mentioned is a proof on its own with enough strength to prove prophethood. Even if some of them, supposing the impossible, were to be regarded as weak, they could still not properly be called such, since whatever is united with the strong also becomes strong. 
When considered together, the 16 examples given above constitute a great and strong miracle through the strength of definite, indisputable consensus in meaning. And when this miracle is joined by 14 other miracles of plenty that have not been mentioned, it manifests a supreme miracle which is as unbreakable as a collection of strong ropes. Now add this supreme miracle to the 14 other kinds of miracle and see what a definite, decisive, and irrefutable proof they provide for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thus, the pillar of Muhammad's prophethood formed by such a collection has the strength of a mountain. Now you have understood how unreasonable it is to regard as unstable and liable to fall that lofty, firm heaven due to doubts arising from lack of understanding in particular matters and examples. Certainly those miracles concerning increase and plenty show that Muhammad the Arabian والسلام, was the beloved official and honored servant of one all compassionate and munificent who creates all sustenance and provides all beings with it for contrary to his practice he sent him banquets of different varieties of food out of nothing from the pure unseen it is well known that the Arabian Peninsula is a place where water and agriculture are scarce for this reason its people and particularly the companions in the early days of Islam suffered want and scarcity they were also frequently afflicted with thirst. Due to this, the important of the manifest miracles of Muhammad والسلام, concerned food and water. Rather than being miracles proving his claim to prophethood, these wonders were on account of need and like divine gifts, dominical bounty, and banquets of the most merciful one for his most noble messenger. For those who saw the miracles had already assented to his prophethood. However, as the miracles took place, their belief increased and became more luminous. Tenth Sign Cooperating the miracles concerning trees and reported in the form of consensus is the miracle of the moaning of the pole. Yes, the pole's moaning in the Prophet's mosque before a vast crowd because of its temporary separation from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam both confirms and strengthens the instances of miracles related to trees. For the pole also was of wood. Their substance was the same. However, the reports of this miracle itself form a consensus whereas the others are thus as a group in one class, most of them individually or separately not attaining the degree of explicit consensus. When delivering the sermon in the mosque, Allah's noble messenger والسلام, used to lean against a pole consisting of a date palm. But when the pulpit was made, he began to give the sermon from there, whereupon the pole moaned and wailed like a camel. The whole congregation heard it. Only when the Prophet came down from the pulpit to it and placed his hand on it, speaking to it and consoling it, did the pole stop moaning. This miracle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was narrated through numerous chains of transmission at the degree of consensus. Indeed, the miracle of the moaning of the pole is very widely known and there is true consensus concerning it. Hundreds of authorities on hadith of the subsequent generation narrated the miracle through 15 chains of transmission from an illustrious group of companions and passed it down to succeeding centuries. From that group, eminent scholars among the companions and leading experts on hadith such as Anas bin Malik and Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari, both servants of the Prophet, Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Abbas, Sah bin Sa'ad, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Ubay bin Kaab, Buraida, and Umm Salama, the mother of believers, each at the head of a chain of transmission, reported this same miracle to the Prophet's community. Foremost, Bukhari, Muslim, and the authentic books of Hadith gave accounts of this great miracle, concerning which there is consensus of reports, together with its lines of transmission for succeeding generations. Jabir, in his chain of transmission, says, 
Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, used to lean against a wooden pole called the palm trunk while delivering the sermon in the mosque. The pole could not endure it when the pulpit was made, and the messenger used that for the sermon and began to moan and wail like a pregnant camel. In his narration, Anas says, it moaned like a water buffalo, causing the mosque to tremble. In his narration, Sah bin Sa'ad says, and weeping increased among the people on the poles moaning. In his narration, Ubay bin Ka'ab says, it wept so much it split. While in another narration, the noble messenger said, it is weeping at being separated from the recitation of Allah's names and the mentioning of Allah during the sermon. Still, another narration reports that Allah's messenger said, if I had not embraced and consoled it, it would have wept at being separated from Allah's messenger until doomsday. In his narration, Buraida reports, When the pole began to moan, Allah's messenger put his hand on it and said, If you wish, I will return you to the grove you came from. Your roots will grow and you will flourish. You will produce new fruits. Or, if you wish, I will plant you in paradise and Allah's friends, the saints, will eat of your fruit. He then listened to the pole. The people behind Allah's messenger could hear it as it spoke, saying, Plant me in paradise, where there is no decay, so that Almighty Allah's beloved servants will eat of my fruit. The messenger said, I will, and added, It has preferred the eternal realm to that of transitoriness. Abu Ishaq Isfarani, one of the great authorities on theology, narrated, Allah's messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, did not go to the pole but it came to him at his command. Then at his command it returned to its place. Ubay bin Ka'ab says, After this extraordinary event, Allah's messenger ordered that the pole be put under the pulpit. It was put there and remained there until the mosque was pulled down before being rebuilt. Then Ubay bin Ka'ab took it and kept it until it decayed. The famous scholar Hassan al-Basri would weep while teaching this miraculous event to his students and say to them, A piece of wood demonstrated love and longing for Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salatu was salam. So you should feel more love than that. As for us, we say, yes, and love and longing for him is shown through following his illustrious practices and sacred sharia. An important point. If it is asked, why were the other miracles, which were demonstrated in relation to food, to satisfy fully a thousand men with four handfuls of food in the battle of Khandaq, and another thousand men with water flowing from the messenger's blessed fingers, not narrated through numerous chains of transmission as the miracle of the moaning of the pole, although the former two miracles occurred in the presence of larger crowds? The answer... The miracles that were manifested were of two kinds. One were manifested at the hands of Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, in order to make people assent to his prophethood. The moaning of the pole was of that kind. It occurred solely as a proof and affirmation of prophethood to increase the believer's faith, to urge the dissemblers to sincerity and belief, and to bring to belief the unbelievers. That is why everyone, the low and the high, saw it, and great attention was paid to broadcasting it. However, the miracles concerning food and water were wonders rather than miracles, or divine favors rather than wonders, or, more than favor, they were banquets bestowed by the All-Merciful One because of need. For sure, they were proofs of his claim to prophethood and miracles, but their basic aim was this. The army was hungry, so Almighty Allah provided a feast for a thousand men out of a handful of food from his treasury in the unseen, just as he creates a thousand pounds of dates from a single seed. And for a thirsty army fighting in his way, he caused water to flow like the water of Kautha from the fingers of the commander-in-chief and gave them to drink. It is for this reason that all the examples of the miracles concerning food and water do not attain the degree of the miracle of the moaning of the pole. However, in their entirety, the various kinds of these two miracles are as numerous 
and unanimously reported as the moaning of the pole. Moreover, not everyone could see the increase of food and water flowing from his fingers. They could only see the results, whereas everyone heard the pole moaning, so it was more widely broadcast. If it is asked, all the actions and conduct of Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, were recorded and transmitted by his companions with extreme care. Why then are such great miracles only narrated through 10 or 20 chains of transmission when they should have been narrated through a hundred? Also, why are many narrated from Anas, Jabir, and Abu Huraira, and few related from Abu Bakr and Umar? The answer. The answer to the first part of the question has been given in the third principle in the fourth sign. Regarding the second part, just as someone in need of medicine goes to a doctor, mathematicians are consulted on mathematical problems, and questions to do with the Sharia are asked of the Mufti, and so on. So too, some of the scholars among the companions were charged with the duty of instructing succeeding centuries in the Hadiths of the Prophet, working with all their strength for this end. Yes, Abu Huraira devoted his entire life to memorizing hadiths while Umar was occupied with the world of politics and the caliphate. Umar therefore narrated very few traditions relying on persons like Abu Huraira, Anas, and Jabir to teach the hadiths to the Muslim community. Furthermore, on a well-known, truthful, sincere, honest, and trusted companion reporting an incident through one chain, it was regarded as sufficient, and no need remained for another to narrate it. That is why some significant events were narrated through only two or three chains of transmission. Eleventh sign. As the tenth sign explained miracles of the prophet related to trees, the eleventh sign will describe how rocks and mountains among lifeless creatures also demonstrated prophetic miracles. Here we cite a few out of numerous instances. First example, the great scholar of the Maghrib, Qadi Iyad, in his Shifa al-Sharif, with a celebrated chain of authorities and great imams like Bukhari, report through an authentic narration from Ibn Mas'ud, the Prophet's servant. While eating together with Allah's noble messenger, wassalam, we used to hear the food glorifying Allah. Second example, Accurate books of hadith report from Anas and Abu Dar through an authentic narration. Anas, the Prophet's servant, said, We were together with Allah's Messenger, wassalam, when he took up a handful of small stones and they began to praise Allah in his blessed palm. Then he put them in Abu Bakr, the voracious's hand, and again they glorified Allah. In his line of transmission, Abu Dar al-Gifari says, then he put them into Umar's hand, and again they glorified Allah. Then he took them and put them on the ground, and they were silent. Then he again took them and put them in Uthman's hand, where again they began to glorify Allah. Abu Dhar and Anas relate, He put them in our hands, and they were silent. Third example. It is established through a sound narration from Ali Jabir and Aisha al-Sadiqa, rocks and mountains would say to Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu salam Peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. In Ali's chain of narration it says, Whenever we went around in the environs of Mecca in the early days of his prophethood, the trees and rocks we encountered would declare, Peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. While in his chain of transmission, Jabir says, Whenever the noble messenger came across rocks and trees, they would prostrate before him, that is, demonstrating obedience to him, they would declare, Peace be upon you, O messenger of Allah. In one of Jabir's narrations, the messenger said, I know a rock that salutes me. Some said that he intended the black stone of the Kaaba. In her line of transmission, Aisha said, Allah's messenger said, when Jibril brought me the message, I would never pass by a rock or a tree without it saying, Peace be upon you, O Messenger of Allah. Fourth example. 
Reported through an authentic narration from Abbas, Allah's messenger, alayhi salat was salam, covered Abbas and his four sons, Abdullah, Ubaid Allah, Fadl, and Husam, with a piece of cloth called Mula'at, praying, O oh, my sustainer, this is my uncle, protect through me these his sons and veil them from the fire as I veil them with this cloth. The roof, door, and the walls of the house joined in the prayer at once, saying, Amin, Amin. Fifth example. Accurate books, notably Bukhari, Ibn Hibban, Daud, and Tirmidhi, unanimously report from Anas, Abu Huraira, Uthman, Din Nurain, and Sa'ad bin Zaid from among the ten promised paradise, Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salat was salam, climbed Mount Uhud together with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Umar al-Farouk, and Uthman bin Nurain, either due to their awesomeness or out of its own joy and happiness. The mountain began to tremble and stir. Allah's messenger said, Steady, for upon you are a prophet, a voracious one, Siddiq, and two martyrs. This tradition is giving news from the unseen that Umar and Uthman were going to be martyred. As a supplement to this tradition, it is narrated that when Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, migrated from Mecca, pursued by the unbelievers, they climbed the mountain called Thubir. The mountain said, Leave me, O messenger of Allah. I am afraid that Allah will punish me if they strike you on me. Then Mount Hira called to him, Come to me, O Messenger of Allah. For this reason, men of intuition feel fear on Mount Thubir and a sense of safety on Mount Hira. As can be understood from this example, these vast mountains are each an individual servant of Allah. Each glorifies and praises Him. Each is charged with duties. They recognized and loved Allah's Messenger. They are not without purpose or owner. Sixth example. Reported through an authentic narration from Abdullah bin Umar. While delivering the sermon from the pulpit, Allah's Messenger والسلام, recited the verse, No just estimate have they made of Allah such as is due to Him. On the day of judgment, the whole earth will be but his handful, and the heavens will be rolled up in his right hand, and said, Allah the Compeller is exalting himself and saying, I am the Compeller, I am the Compeller, I am the Mighty, I am the Most High. As he said this, the pulpit so trembled and shook that we were frightened it would cause Allah's Messenger to fall. Seventh example. It is reported through an authentic narration from Ibn Abbas, known as the scholar of the Muslim community and interpreter of the Qur'an, and Ibn Mas'ud, the servant of the Prophet and one of the great scholars of the companions, that they said, on the conquest of Mecca, there were 360 idols around the Kaaba, fixed with lead to the stone. That day, the noble Prophet والسلام, pointed to each of the idols, in turn with the stick he was holding curved like a bow, saying, The truth has arrived, and falsehood has perished. Indeed, falsehood is ever bound to perish. Whichever one he pointed to, it fell down. If he pointed to the face of the idol, it fell backwards. Otherwise, it fell on its face. Thus, they all toppled over and fell to the ground. Eighth example. This is the famous story of the well-known monk, Bahira. Before the beginning of his prophethood, Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, was traveling towards Damascus to trade together with his uncle Abu Talib and some of the Quraysh. They rested when they came near the church of Bahira, the monk. Bahira, who was a hermit and did not mix with the people, suddenly came out. He saw Muhammad, the trustworthy, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, among the caravan and said, He is the Lord of the world. He will be a prophet. The Quraysh asked, How do you know? The holy monk replied, I saw a small cloud over the caravan as you were coming. When you sat down, the cloud moved toward him and cast its shadow over him. I also saw trees and rocks prostrate themselves before him, which they do only before prophets. 
There are at least 80 examples of the same kind as these eight instances. When they came together, these eight instances form a chain so strong that no doubt can break it or shake it. Taken as a whole, this sort of miracle, that is, the speaking of inanimate beings in order to testify to his prophethood, expresses the same certainty as consensus in meaning. Each example receives strength greater than its own from the strength of the whole. Yes, a slender pole becomes strong on coming together with stout poles. On becoming a soldier and joining the army, a weak, powerless man becomes so strong he may challenge a thousand men. Twelfth sign. This consists of three examples related to the eleventh sign, but which are examples of the greatest importance. First example. And when you threw, it was not you who threw. It was rather Allah that threw, as established by the researchers of all Quranic commentators and by the reports of the scholars of Hadith. This verse refers to the following incident during the Battle of Badr. Allah's noble messenger والسلام, took up a handful of earth and small stones and threw them at the army of the unbelievers, saying, May your faces be deformed. Just as these words entered the ears of all of them, despite being a single phrase, so too the handful of earth entered the eyes of each one of the unbelievers. Each became preoccupied with his eyes, and although on the attack, the army suddenly turned tail and fled. Also, during the Battle of Hunayn, the authorities on Hadith and foremost Imam Muslim report that like at the Battle of Badr, he again threw a handful of earth while the unbelievers were staging a fierce attack, saying, May your faces be deformed. The handful of earth struck the faces of each of them with Allah's leave, the same as words of the phrase entered the ears of each. Busy with their eyes, they retreated and fled. Since this extraordinary event at Badr and Hunayn is not within man's power and ordinary causes, the Quran of miraculous exposition states, When you threw, it was not you who threw. It was rather Allah that threw. That is, the event was outside human power. It occurred not through human ability, but in an extraordinary manner through divine power. Second example. The accurate books and foremost Bukhari and Muslim narrate that during the Khaybar expedition, a Jewess roasted a goat, filling it with a very strong poison. She then sent it to Allah's Messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam. The companions had begun to eat it when the Prophet suddenly said, Withdraw your hands. It tells me it is poisoned. Everyone pulled back his hand. But Bishr bin al Bara had eaten a single morsel and died from the effects of the severe poison. The noble messenger sent for the Jewess called Zainab and asked her why she had done it. The inauspicious woman said, I considered that if you were a prophet, it would not harm you. And if you were a king, I would save the people from you. According to some narrations, the prophet did not have her put to death, but left her to Bishr's family to be killed. Now listen to a few points demonstrating aspects of the miraculousness in this extraordinary incident. The first, according to one narration, some of the companions also heard the goat speaking. The second, according to another narration, Allah's messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, said, Say bismillah, then eat. The poison will not affect you. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani does not accept this narration, but others do. The third, the treacherous Jews wanted to deal a sudden blow at Allah's Messenger والسلام, and his close companions, but being informed about this from the unseen, the Prophet's warning proved true, and their plot was uncovered and brought to naught. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from whom the companions never heard an untrue statement, said, This goat tells me that? Everyone believed him with conviction as sure as if they themselves had heard the goat. Third example. This consists of three instances of another miracle which resembles the shining hand and staff of Musa. The first, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal explaining and authenticating a narration from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri reports, One dark and stormy night, the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, 
gave Qatada bin al-Numan a staff saying, This staff will light up ten yards all around you. You will see a dark shadow when you arrive at your house. It is Satan. Throw him out of the house and drive him away. Qatada took the staff and set off. It cast a light like Musa's shining hand. He came to his house where he saw the shadowy figure and he drove it away. The second, while fighting the idolaters during the great battle of Badr, itself a source of wonders, Ukasha bin Muhassin al-Asadi had his sword broken. Allah's noble messenger والسلام, gave him a stout staff in place of it saying, fight with this. Suddenly, with Allah's leave, the staff became a long white sword and he fought with it. He carried the sword on his person for the rest of his life until he fell as a martyr during the battle of Al-Yamama. This incident is certain because throughout his life he carried the sword with pride and it became famous with the name of Sakor. Thus, two proofs of this incident are Ukasha's pride and the sword's name, Sakor, and its widespread fame. The third, it is narrated by authorities on hadith like Ibn Abdul Bar, a celebrated scholar known as the scholar of the age, that at the battle of Uhud, a cousin of Allah's messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam, Abdullah bin Jash's sword was broken. Allah's prophet gave him a staff which became a sword in his hand. He fought with it, and after the battle, that product of a miracle remained a sword. In his siyar, the well-known Ibn Sayyid al-Nas reports that some time later, Abdullah sold the sword to a man called Bura al turki for 200 liras. Thus, these two swords were each miracles like the staff of Musa. For while no aspect of miraculousness remained in his staff after Musa's death, these swords remained unchanged. Thirteenth Sign Another of the miracles of Muhammad والسلام, of which there are numerous instances which are reported unanimously is the sick and the wounded being healed through his blessed breath. The reports of this kind of miracle are, as a whole, unanimous in meaning. Some of the instances of these miracles also are considered to be unanimous in meaning. And if the others are single reports, since they have been rendered and confirmed as authentic by the exacting authorities of the science of Hadith, they afford the certainty of science. We shall mention a few instances of the miracles out of many. First example, the learned scholar of the Maghrib, Qadi Iyad, in his Shifa al-Sharif, narrates through an elevated chain of authorities and numerous lines of transmission that Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, the Prophet's servant and commander, and commander-in-chief of the army of Islam in the time of Umar, the conqueror of Iran, and one of the ten promised paradise, said, I was at the noble Prophet's side during the battle of Uhud. He shot arrows at the unbelievers until his bow broke. Then he gave arrows to me, telling me to shoot them. The arrows he gave me were without flights, that is, without the feathers which help them fly. He was ordering me to shoot them, which I did, and they flew like flighted arrows, hitting the unbelievers' bodies and piercing them. At that point, Qatada bin Nu'man was hit in the eye by an arrow. It was struck out of his head so that it was sitting on the side of his face. Allah's Messenger والسلام, took the eye in his blessed healing hand and placed it in its socket. It was healed as though nothing had happened to it and became the better of his two eyes. This event became very widely known. A grandson of Qatada even once described himself to Umar bin Abdul Aziz as, I am the grandson of one who, when Allah's most noble messenger placed his eye back in its socket after it had been struck out, it was suddenly healed and became his best eye. He said this in verse, introducing himself to Umar in that way. It is also related through an authentic narration that during the battle known as the Yawm di Qarad, Abu Qatada was hit in the face by an arrow. Allah's Prophet touched his face with his blessed hand. Abu Qatada said, I felt no pain at all, nor did the wound fester. Second example. The authentic books of Hadith and foremost Bukhari and Muslim report that the noble Prophet, alayhi salatu wassalam, 
had appointed Ali al Haidari as standard bearer during the Battle of Khaybar, but his eyes were aching severely due to illness. The moment the noble messenger applied his healing spittle to his eyes, they were cured, with no trace of the discomfort remaining. The following morning, Ali conquered the citadel of Khaybar by removing its extremely heavy gate and using it in his hand as a shield. During the same battle, Salama bin al aqwas leg was struck and split open by a sword. Allah's messenger breathed onto it, and the leg was at once healed. Third example. Authorities on the Prophet's life and foremost Sa'i report from Uthman bin Hunayf, who said, A blind man came to Allah's noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and said, Pray so that my eyes may be healed and I may see. The Prophet said, Go and take the ablutions, then pray two rakats, and say, O oh Allah, I beseech you, and I turn to you for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of mercy. O oh Muhammad, I turn to your sustainer for your sake, and through you, asking that he uncover my sight. O oh Allah, make him my intercessor. He went and did this. And when he returned, we saw that his eyes had opened and he could see very well. Fourth example. A great authority, Ibn Wahhab, reports, The hero, Mu'awid bin Afra, one of the 14 martyrs of the Battle of Badr, had his hand cut off by Abu Jahl, the accursed, while fighting with him. He took the hand with his other hand and went to the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah's Messenger stuck the hand in its place and spread his spittle over it. It was at once healed. Wa'id went again to fight and continued to do so until he was martyred. Imam Jalil bin Wahab also reports, During that same battle, Hubay bin Yasaf was struck on the shoulder by a sword so that he received a grievous wound with part of it almost severed. The noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, joined the arm and shoulder back together again and breathed on it, and it was healed. Thus, for sure, these two incidents are separate, single reports. But if an authority like Ibn Wahhab considered them to be sound, and if they occurred during a battle like that of Badr, which was a spring of miracles, and if there are many other examples which resemble these two incidents, for sure it may be said that they definitely occurred. Indeed, there are perhaps a thousand examples established in authentic traditions for which the blessed hand of Allah's Messenger والسلام, was healing. A question. You describe many things as being reported unanimously through many channels, but we are hearing most of them for the first time. Surely something, the various reports of which are numerous and unanimous, cannot remain thus secret. The answer, there are numerous things concerning which there is consensus in their various reports and which are self-evident to the learned scholars of the Sharia, but are unknown to those who are not one of them. For the scholars of Hadith, there are many such things, which for poets have not even the status of isolated reports, and so on. The specialists of all the sciences explain the theories and axioms of their science, and the ordinary people rely on them and either submit to them or become one of them and see for themselves. Now, the events, the reports of which we describe as forming true consensus, consensus in meaning, or which express certainty like consensus, have been shown to be thus by both the scholars of Hadith and the scholars of the Sharia and the scholars of the principles of religion and by most of the other levels of the ulama. If ordinary people in their heedlessness or the ignorant who close their eyes to the truth do not know this, the fault is theirs. A passage worthy of being written in gold and diamonds. Yes, it was mentioned above, small stones glorifying and praising Allah in his hand and in accordance with the verse, when you threw, it was not you who threw. Earth and small stones in the same hand becoming missiles and projectiles against the enemy, routing them, and according to the verse, and the moon split, 
the moon splitting at a sign of the fingers of the same hand, and water flowing like a spring from the ten fingers of the same hand, and there providing a whole army with water, and the same hand being healing to the sick and wounded. All this shows what a wondrous miracle of divine power that blessed hand was. It was as if, for friends, its palm was a small place for the remembrance of Allah, for as soon as small stones entered it, they glorified Allah and recited his names, while in the face of enemies, it was a small dominical ammunition store, which, when pebbles and earth entered it, they were transformed into missiles and projectiles. And for the sick and the wounded, it was a small pharmacy of the most merciful one, which was a cure for whatever ills it touched. When it rose with glory, it split the moon, giving it the shape of two bows, while when it was lowered with beauty, it became like a spring of mercy with ten spigots pouring forth the water of Kauthad. If the single hand of such a one is the means of those wondrous miracles, is it not then to be understood clearly how acceptable he is before the creator of the universe, and how loyal he is to his cause, and how fortunate are those who declare their allegiance to him? Fifth example. Having explained and authenticated it, Imam Baghawi relates, At the battle of Khandak, Ali bin al-Hakam's leg was broken by the blow of an unbeliever. The noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, rubbed it. At the moment he did so, it was healed, so that Ali bin al-Hakam did not even dismount from his horse. Sixth example. The scholars of Hadith and foremost Imam Bayhaqi relate, Ali was very ill. In his distress, he was moaning and praying for himself. The noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, came and said, O oh Allah, grant him healing, and touched Ali with his foot. He told him to stand, and Ali was at once cured. He stated, I never again suffered from that illness. Seventh example. This is the well-known story of Shurah bil al-Jufi. He had a morbid growth in the palm of his hand, so that he could hold neither his sword nor the reins of his horse. Allah's Messenger والسلام, rubbed the growth with his blessed hand and massaged it. Not a trace of it remained. Eighth example. Six children, each the object of a different miracle of Muhammad wasallam. The first, Ibn Abi Shaiba, a meticulous researcher and well-known scholar of Hadith, relates that a woman brought her child to Allah's Messenger والسلام, the child had an affliction. He could not speak and was an idiot. Allah's messenger rinsed his mouth with water and washed his hands, then gave the water to the woman, telling her to give it to the child to drink. After the child had drunk it, nothing remained of his illness and affliction, and he became so intelligent, he surpassed even the brightest of the rest. The second, according to an authentic narration, Ibn Abbas said, an insane child was brought to the noble messenger alayhi salatu wasalam. He placed his blessed hand on the child's chest and the child suddenly vomited a small black object like a cucumber. The child was healed and went home. The third, Imam Bayhaqi and Nasai relate through an authentic chain of transmission that a child called Muhammad bin al-Hatib had been scalded by a pan of boiling water and his whole arm burnt. Allah's noble messenger والسلام, touched the arm, spreading his spittle over it. The same instant, it was healed. The fourth, a child who was not young but was mute came to the noble messenger. والسلام. He asked the child, Who am I? The child, who had been mute from birth, replied, You are the messenger of Allah, and started to speak. The fifth, Jalal al-Din Suyuti, who was honored with conversing with Allah's Messenger والسلام, on many occasions while awake and was the leading scholar of his age, explaining and authenticating a narration, reports, Soon after being born, a famous person called Mubarak al-Yamama was taken to the Prophet. On his turning to the baby, it started to speak, saying, I testify that you are the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet exclaimed, May Allah bless you. The child never spoke again in his infancy, 
and later became famous as Mubarak al Yamama, the Blessed One, Yamama, since he had been the object of this miracle of the Prophet and his prayer. The sixth, one time an ill mannered youth interrupted the prayer of the noble messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, by passing in front of him while he was performing it. Allah's messenger said, O oh Allah, cut short his paces. After this, the child was unable to walk as a punishment for his bad behavior. The seventh, a shameless woman, who was like a child, asked for a piece of the food Allah's Messenger والسلام, was eating. He gave her some, but she said, No, I want a piece from your mouth. So he gave her a piece, and after eating the morsel, she became the most modest and bashful woman in Medina. There are not 80, but perhaps 800 further examples of this miracle similar to the eight mentioned above, most of which are related in the Hadith books and books of the Prophet's biography. For sure, since the blessed hand of Allah's Messenger والسلام, was like a pharmacy of Luq, man the wise, and his spittle was like a spring of Khidr's water of life, and his breath soothing and healing like that of Isa alayhi salam, Certainly many people would have recourse to him. And the sick, children, and the insane did flock to him in great numbers, and they were all healed. Abu Abdul Rahman al-Yamani, known as Tabus, even who made the Hajj forty times and for forty years performed the morning prayer with the ablution of the preceding night prayers, and who met with many of the companions and was one of the greatest scholars of the generation following them, stated and made the certain report that however many lunatics came to Allah's messenger والسلام, placing his hand on their chests they were all healed not one was not cured thus since a great scholar such as that who had direct connections with the era of the prophet made such definite and general statements for sure none of the sick who came to Allah's prophet were not healed they were all healed. Since this was the case, certainly thousands would have had recourse to him. 